God loved the world, that means he loves you, and he died for you. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, and that is, how many of you have had an encounter with Jesus? An encounter with Jesus. If you're online right now, and you're watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, or maybe you're watching this later on demand, have you had an encounter with Jesus? The Holy Spirit moved, and men recorded the encounters that they had. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with Jesus. And these Gospels, and the Gospel of Jesus has forever changed the world. Mark, in Mark chapter number 2, and some say he got this eyewitness account and rehearsed it with Peter himself and put this Gospel to pen. Mark chapter number 2 records one of my favorite encounters with Jesus. One of my favorite stories of how Jesus changes things and changes the narrative of someone's life when they come into his presence. Now Mark chapter number two is early in the ministry of Jesus. And remember, before Jesus was born and comes and unleashes his ministry, there was a period of silence in the world. The time between the Old Testament and the New Testament was some 400 years. 400 years without miracles. 400 years without the Holy Spirit moving and giving us His Word. 400 years and people waned and waxed far from God. And then, like a, a, like a burst of lightning, God begins to move and work in the life of a little family and and through this woman Mary and, and her husband Joseph, and Mary is, is now uh, it holding and indwelling the, through the power of the Holy Spirit this baby who is Jesus, and Jesus lives, he's born a sinless life, and when he's about 30 years old, he busts on the scene, and everything is different because Jesus lived on this earth and worked in this earth. Now, we're only in Mark chapter 2, but if you put all the Gospels together, as we come chronologically, Jesus has already turned water into wine. He's already healed the officer's son. He's healed a demon-possessed man. He even healed Peter's mother-in-law. I often wonder how Peter felt about that. Maybe mixed emotions. I'm not sure. That was a bad joke, but thank you for those who, who humored me by laughing. He healed the sick and the possessed after sunset. He caused Peter to catch that multitude of fish. We talked about that not too long ago. He healed a leopard, and he had healed a centurion's servant. Notice Jesus had a ministry of generosity and healing. Jesus was a giver. He didn't come to be served. He had every right to be. He didn't come to be served. Anybody here last week? But he came to be a servant, a humble servant. And notice what happens when you are a giver, when you are a healer, when you are a servant. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And again, he entered in Capernaum after some days, And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, verse 2, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Pause. When you are a giver, when you speak life, when you are a healer, when you are a servant, notice you are attractive. People want to be around you. People rush into this house. They fill up a room because Jesus was generous with his ministry. May this be known as uh, the, the, the mission of our church is that we want to flow like Jesus flowed. I don't want to be known as a church that takes. I want to be known as a church that gives. 
But I want you to know the church is not some nebulous of some mystical. N- the church, that's a part of it, but the church is us. We are the church. So if the church is going to be generous, if the church is going to give life, if the church is going to right serve, that means you have to do all those things. And notice what happens when you are in that flow. God draws things to you. God brings things to you. Things are gathered in your life because you're an attractive. I'm not talking about physical beauty. Y'all look pretty good. I'll give it up to you. But I'm talking about inner spiritual beauty that is in Christ. It was noise that he was in the house. It was heard. The rumors are now spreading. If it was today, it would be trending on Twitter. Hashtag Jesus is in the house. And people fill up this house so much so that there is no room. You can't even get through the door. I often wonder what Jesus preached in this particular situation. Now, it's not recorded. It doesn't give us the sermon. We have so many sermons. We have so many teachings of Jesus. But on this particular day, no one took notes. Kind of like you guys are looking at me right now. Yeah, maybe they were tired. Maybe they did outreach the night before. Uh, Maybe Jesus had done one of those long Sermon on the Mount type sermon series. And they were wore out. And so no one takes notes. It could have been maybe that they were tired, Brother CJ, but maybe it was just so good. You ever been in service like that before? Like you were so captivated by the presence of the Lord in that service. You couldn't move. You're just standing there in awe with your mouth wide open. I I happen to just imagine in my mind, because this is one of those encounters that is just like so awesome, that that was one of those days. That as he is preaching, and the Bible says he preached the word to them, that he just drops knowledge and truth like they had never received before. Maybe Jesus did what I do sometimes, and I preach sermons over again. Uh, Maybe he says this sermon, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And and maybe somebody was in the back and they said, what does that mean, Jesus? Tell us what that means. And maybe Jesus stopped for a moment and gave an interpretation of what he just said. And maybe he said something like this. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to find real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace and I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I bet you Jesus had bars. I bet you he could flow, man. Jesus said things like this, learn of me. You, do you realize, you know, you talk about, you know, simile and metaphor, learn of me. Not only was he the teacher, he was also the subject. Jesus is, he's probably flowing on this night and everybody's just, and no one can take notes. And we don't know what he preached on. So often he knew who he was speaking to. He would take things that they understood. He was speaking to an agrarian society. So he'd take farming things He'd take agricultural things and he would use them as his illustration. Remember, he went to the woman at the well and he used water as an illustration to say that he was the living water. Why do you say that, Pastor Kirk? I want you to know that Jesus still knows who his audience is. He knows every person that's in this room today. He knew that you would be here before you were even born. And he knows exactly how to talk to your heart. He knows exactly what to say. He knows exactly what song to sing. He knows exactly what story needs to be told. And there's times that the preacher will be preaching on one thing, but God will lead your heart to another, and he'll minister to you, and it did not even have anything to do with the message. He knows how to talk to you and get your attention, doesn't he? He's the master of it. And so I see in the midst of Jesus' ministry, the first thing is the crowd. A crowd of people. You know, churches seem to be enamored 
with a crowd. But I don't see Jesus so enamored with the crowd. If you were to start in Matthew and work your way all the way through John, you'll see several times Jesus has thousands and thousands and thousands of people following him. But you'll also see several times right in the middle of that crowd, you know what he would do? He'd slip away. He'd leave to go be by himself and pray. I think sometimes we're all enamored by the crowds. We're enamored by the numbers. We're enamored by this great idea of the the house was packed out. If you grew up in church or you've been in church long enough, you'll have even people relate the crowd into a spiritual experience. You know, they'll come in the church and say, that was a great day at church. There wasn't anything different. It was just a bunch of people there. Sometimes we're enamored with the crowd, but I want you to know that in the midst of the crowd, Jesus sees the one. They're pressing about him in another time. And they're walking go to go do a healing, to go heal Jairus' daughter. The crowd is thronging him about, and he can barely move. There's a crowd all along. But there's a little lady who says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And notice what? He says, stop the, stop the crowd. Stop everything. Somebody touched me. Jesus recognizes people in the crowd. Jesus recognizes with all the distractions of your life, all the distractions of this world, every time you think you've been for God, he says, I see right where you are. I see you in the midst of the crowd. You say, why are you saying this, pastor? Because I am speaking to people who have so much going on in their lives and so many things and so many interactions and you right now are sitting in the middle of this crowd, but you may feel all alone. You got a huge family. You got a thriving office. You got a, you got a big community of friends. But I think an epidemic and a pandemic right now is of loneliness. And I want you to know that Jesus sees you. He knows right what you're going through, and he can push through the crowd of your life, and he can recognize your situation. As we keep reading, he preached the word to him, but notice what happens. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of... Everybody awake this morning? He goes so much faster when you act like you're listening. (laughs) There's four guys carrying a paralyzed man. They couldn't get to Jesus because of... There are still hurting people today who can't get to Jesus because of the crowd. There are still people today who are tripping over the crowd. Tripping over the rhetoric, tripping over the false teaching, the false doctrine, the news, the this, the that. Everything they say that is in the name of Christ, that is not in the name of Christ. The crowd of ideas, the crowd of noise, they're tripping and and can't get to Jesus. But in this story, there are four people who are determined to get through the crowd and to help someone who's crippled. He's a paralyzed man. And I think here his condition, not only is it physical, but it is symbolic to all of our conditions. All of us have things that cripple us, things that set us back, things that are hurts in our lives. There's an obscure name in the Old Testament It's a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. The Bible tells us this story that though he was in the lineage of King David, he had been forgotten because he was crippled. And he was crippled because his nurse dropped him when he was a baby. I wonder how many people under the sound of my voice right now have been hurt by people who should have took care of you. You've been hurt by people who should have watched after you. 
hurt by people who were supposed to have your best interest in their mind, but they dropped it. They, they dropped the ball. Oh, I know I'm preacher better than y'all responding right now. I know I got a group of people who had a daddy who walked out and he was supposed to take care of business and he didn't. I know I have some people who've been abused and been hurt and, and the person who could have cared for you actually was the person who, who hurt you. Hey, I'm telling you that Jesus sees crippled people today. All of our hurts, all of our hangups, every time we fall, every time we're broken, Jesus is about to have an encounter with the crippled man. He was disabled. He was discarded. His life, no doubt, was dysfunctional. But his, the greatest of his handicaps were not physical. They were spiritual. And I want you to know this and hear this. Of all the stuff that we deal with in life, the spiritual stuff is the most important. I remember I was counseling with a dear friend who happened to be an, an addict. And we were working through his recovery. And we're talking through options and solutions. And I remember I looked him right in his eyeballs, as we would say, dead in his eye. And I said to him, you know your problem's not drugs? He looked at me with a look of surprise to say, oh, really? <laughs> I mean, have you not seen that I've hurt my family, I've hurt myself, and I I've done, I've messed up and ruined my life? You're telling me my problem's not drugs? I said, yeah, your problem's not drugs. Your problem is the hurt that you're trying to medicate with the drugs. And until you deal with the hurt that's causing you to run to drugs, you'll never get healing. You'll never get recovery. The drugs is just a symptom of the real problem. And here this man's problem was not that he was physically handicapped. And your problem is not whatever physically ever happened to you. Our greatest need is a spiritual need. We're spiritual people. We're spiritual beings. And notice that Jesus here in this moment is going to first address his spiritual problem. I'm all for feeding our community, obviously. <laughs> we fed several hundred of them yesterday. And we ran around this town last night after y'all were gone uh, with boxes of food feeding people. And by the way, there's a, there's a box truck. <laughs> there's half a box truck going to be outside the doors on your way out for you. to uh, for you. I, Zach's trying to give me a message. We'll tell that at the end. But there's a box truck full of food. Uh, that you're going to take with you to go serve people in your neighborhoods and your neighbors and your family with. I'm all about feeding people. But listen, if you die without Jesus with a full stomach, I failed. If you died with a job without Jesus, <laughs> I failed. You died with an education without Jesus, I failed. I'm not saying food and, and, and empowerment and education aren't important. I'm going to tell you how we partner in just a moment in all of those things. But I do it all for the main reason. And that's because we're all spiritual people. And can I prove to you that that's what's most important? Because I bet you every single one of us knows someone who's educated, who's successful, and even wealthy and miserable. But I've met some people who don't have two nickels to rub together hardly. Nobody knows them, but they got the joy of the Lord. They got the joy of their salvation. They have peace that passes understanding because their spirit is right. He puts them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And so I see the crowd and the cripple. This man is powerless. He is helpless. At times, no doubt, he felt hopeless. But thank God he is not friendless. Because I see carriers. Carriers. Look at the Bible says again. Can we go back to the scripture? He preaches the word to them. It says, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. 
So when they had broken through, somebody say breakthrough. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. The house that day was packed, but only four people were woke. How many people walked by this paralyzed man on their way to church? A house full of them. But there were four people alert. Four people, let me use these words. They were empathetic, they were innovative, and they were expectant. If you don't take any other notes, get this. I'm looking, I believe God's calling up and raising up. I'm praying and I'm inspiring to be a person who's empathetic, innovative, and expectant. You with me? Can I have to say it again? Innovative, empathetic, and expectant. I'll say it one more time. Innovative, empathetic, and expectant. They're empathetic. They see a man in a condition that he shouldn't have to be in. Why? Because Jesus is right down the street. Is there anybody in this room who sees the brokenness as they drive down Glenway, as they drive down Warsaw? They see women on the street. They see the dope boys. They see the drug heads. And they go, there's no reason for this brokenness because Jesus can change your life. I see where you are and I want you to find the healing in Jesus. I'm not just going to keep on driving and not making eye contact. Because they're homeless doesn't mean that they're less of a person or they have less worth. They are a son or daughter of Jesus. And maybe they're lost and they need to come home. Or maybe they're just far from God. Maybe they need healing and hurting. Maybe they need some, some help. Maybe they need to, to get to a hospital. Maybe There's so many things, but I need somebody who will say, I'll get out of my comfort zone. I'll get out of my status quo. I'll get out of my routine to see somebody in a low state. Yeah. Empathetic. They're innovative. Did y'all hear this? Did you read what I read? <laughs> the house is packed. They can't get in. I'm afraid if this ministry would have happened in 2021, we would have said, we did our best. We did everything we could. Hey, let's lay him here out, outside. Maybe Jesus will see him on the way out. Not innovative people. Innovative people said, what have we got up on the roof? What if we open up the roof and got a rope and, and tied this guy to this rope and, and, and dangled him down to get to Jesus? They were willing to risk. I'm not getting up on this roof. How many people say, I, I, don't, I don't like heights. Anybody like that? You with me? I don't like heights. I was dangling on our roof hanging Christmas lights. That'll be the last year you see me up there. I'm sure I can pay somebody to do that. I don't like that. I'm nervous up on the roof. They said, I'm willing to risk it. Notice the Bible says they broke through the roof. They broke through the roof. Homeowners, how would you feel about somebody breaking through your roof? No doubt when they were breaking through, they were tearing it up, but they say, we're going to tear it up now so we can fix it up later. See, see, if somebody's going to have breakthrough, somebody's got to be willing to tear through the ugly. Somebody's got to be willing to dismantle all the nasty. Somebody's going to have to be willing to say, I'm going to me this is going to be messy. It's going to get worse before it gets better, but I want to see breakthrough. And so I'm willing to pay the price so that we can fix this thing later. But what's more important than shingles is this man's soul. And they tie this man up and dangle him from the ceiling. And I, I want to speak to somebody right now. I want you to hear me. I'm, 
I'm going to go to the Internet so the people don't think I'm talking right to them. (laughs) And the reason why you feel so guilty and shameful when you come to church, the reason why when someone starts preaching the Bible, you get this feeling inside of you and you feel very vulnerable and open and scared. And people right now who are listening to my voice and they come and they're like, did the preacher, did somebody tell him what I was going through this week? The reason why you are so open and bare for all to see, you are just like this crippled man dangling from the rope. How many people do not like to be the center of attention? How many people, if you had to walk from that back door up to this platform, it would scare you to death? (laughs) I'm going, to, I'm going to walk down the side. I'm going to come around. I'm going to do everything. And that's why most of the people sit in the back at church. It's not some, they're less spiritual or more spiritual. They're just afraid to, for people to see them and be out in front of everybody. Now, can you imagine this man who no doubt already had insecurities? It, all of his insecurities are open for everybody to see. He is dangling from a rope coming down the roof. All eyes are on him in that moment. And that's how some of you feel spiritually right now. You feel like you're on your last thread. You feel like you're just dangling. And at any moment, it's going to break and it's going to be over. And you don't know if Jesus is going to do it for you. You don't know if it's going to be made right. You don't know if he can fix this one. And look, everybody's watching and everybody can see my drum and my dysfunction. They see all the problems. And you're so scared just dangling on that rope. But if you are in that moment and that's how you feel, I want you to remember That there are four people on the end of that rope, wrapping that rope around their arms. There are four people who have come together in synergy. They have come together and they've come together to say, we got to get this guy to Jesus. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to do things no one has ever done. I want to remind you, if we're going to reach people we've never reached, we got to do things we've never done. And we're going we're gonna to bear the burden and we're going to put our weight behind it. And we're going to do everything we can not to let this man slip. I need someone here today who already knows Jesus to find a spiritual rope and go out to the people who are hopeless. Go out to the people who need help and you get your arm wrapped around that rope and you start holding them in their brokenness. Holding them in their dysfunction. Holding them in their crippled condition. And they better know there's four people who got them. I don't need a lot. I just need four people who say, I got your back, Pastor. I'm praying for you. I believe in you. Let everybody else go. I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. I, hey, I'll keep holding. I'll keep going. I'll keep ministering. I just got to know somebody's on the end of my rope. But my favorite part, and it's going to be your favorite part because it's the last part. (laughs) But that doesn't mean anything to our guest. The last part means I got about 15 more minutes left, right? Not only were they empathetic. Did somebody get scared? Is that why? um, Not only were they empathetic, innovative, but they were, anybody take notes? They were what? expectant. How would, how would you define that? Here's how I define it. Mark chapter number two. The Bible says, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Verse number five. When Jesus saw, what's the next word? Everybody sit up straight, pay attention, let's wake up. (laughs) When Jesus saw, whose faith? There. Now, I graduated from a public school in Dayton, Ohio. But I believe there is a plural pronoun. Singular pronoun, my. His, 
hers, singular. Plural pronoun, their, them. Translation for Kentucky folk, y'all. <laughs> Plural pronoun. When Jesus saw, I'll preach this so much better if you will be hungry right now. When Jesus saw their See, the way some people see this story is that this crippled guy who's hanging there and he's so pitiful and he's crippled, he's coming down and Jesus says, oh, look how pitiful of a poor, wretched sinner. I'm going to do something for him. And that's why they, they, you know, that's why people come down, they come down to the hood and they want to pat somebody on the head and they want to give them a sandwich and they're going to go retreat back to their solid fortress of solitude to be safe. Because they think Jesus is here just to do little pitiful things for little poor people. When he saw their faith, when he saw four men, when he saw four people who said, I am willing to see what no one else see. I am willing to do what no one else will do. And I am willing to believe what no one else believes. When he saw their faith, the faith of the four, he says, then I am going to unleash forgiveness and healing when I see their expectation and belief. This is my humble thesis. Do you know why I believe God is not doing more in our community currently? It's because we are not believing for more in our community. And I believe when we believe for more, and we expect more, and we believe that God literally could turn this neighborhood upside down. Why are you staying here, Pastor? Because I want 20 years from now someone to drive down Warsaw Avenue and go, what happened to this place? And somebody said, when Jesus saw their faith, when he saw their faith. When he saw their faith, he saw some crazy people showing up on Saturday morning and staying till Saturday afternoon. He saw some people on Monday night at Celebrate Recovery. When he saw some people at the Lord's Gym serving homeless and helpless people. When he saw some people tutoring kids at Block Ministry. When he saw ladies at the Redeem Home getting their life clean. When he saw their faith. When he saw... Somebody teaching ballerinas at City of Gospel Mission. Like, when he saw their faith, that's what I'm trying to I better land this plane. Whew. When he saw their faith, there is, there is power in the plural. God has given us power when we come into agreement. Where two or three agree, it is bound in heaven. There is supernatural outside of the singular. When everybody takes their corner and bears the load and holds the rope and a man has an encounter with Jesus. But the last thing that we see in this chapter it says this, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? And here's where I'll stop. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And this is the question I end for you today. Who can forgive sins but God alone? These critics were sitting on a sideline while somebody was trying to do something good. They were across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Hollering and cussing and being angry and hateful. Sitting there saying, how dare you try to do something good? How dare you try to be united? How dare you get past division? How dare you be uh, doing good works? <laughs> They're sitting there on the side with their arms crossed. Who does he think he is? God? That's exactly who Jesus thought he was because he is God. Don't you ever let somebody tell you Jesus didn't know he was God. 
They called him out right here. Don't you think, do you think you're God? And Jesus says, okay, which one's easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power to forgive sins. See, there's going to be people, I'm going to, I got to take this apologetics moment. I'm going to, can I take this apologetic moment? There are people who don't believe Jesus is God. And they're going to highlight his humanity. They're going to call him the Son of Man. It, is this up on the screen? Do we got to go to the next verse? Here it is. They said to them, okay, oh, there it is. You got it. Go back. Go back to where you were. Where were you? There you are. Okay. But, but that you may know that the, the Son of Man has power on earth too. They're going to try to tell you Jesus was just a man, and that's why I use the title Son of Man. That's a, a title out of Ezekiel. He was the Son of Man, but he's also the Son of God. He's the God-man. But notice here, in his humanity, as he is pronouncing this over himself, so that you know the Son of Man, the God-man, has power to forgive sins. I say to the paralytic, I say unto you, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose took up the bed, and went out of the presence of them all so that they were all amazed. Translation, their mouth is hanging wide open. And glorified God and said, we've never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like this. I want you to know when four people are empathetic and innovative and expectant and God notices their expectation and their belief and their faith and then when God has an encounter with a sinner and he's saved and transformed and he changes his life and be in the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to know there are critics who are around, who have nothing to say. Their mouth is wide open because you cannot deny a man who was a drunk who's now leading worship. You cannot deny someone who was a crack addict who is now cooking for the outreach. You cannot deny somebody who was on drugs who are now dragging people to Jesus. So I ask you the question, who's on your rope that you're bringing to Jesus? Who's on your rope? And when you see us do all this crazy, innovative, different stuff you've never seen a church do, just know that's our rope. That's our rope. And so we're going to do parties in the park. That's our rope. Um, we're going to partner with schools. I want to show you this. Um, idea public schools moving to Cincinnati Christian University. They bought it out, $14 million. This Tuesday night, they asked us to host their meet and greet for the community. Of all the different places they could have asked and partnered with, they asked for us to host the meet and greet right here, Tuesday, 630. You get everyone you can because we want to see kids educated. But just know education is just our rope. <laughs> see, I want them to be able to read so they can read the Bible. <laughs> I want them to comprehend so they can comprehend Scripture and comprehend the knowledge of God. So we're going to partner with this school because that's our rope, and we're going to serve. And then this happened on Monday, Midway School. Some of you may have children or grandchildren at Midway School. Midway School, the principal, two years ago, saw us serving at Princeton Middle School for their bridge camp. He called me and said, Pastor Kirk, we have this enrichment program. It's three hours, two, two hours actually. Uh, it's two hours during the day. We have a partnership that we've had in the past. He said, but I've saw, I see what your church does. I've seen what you've done in the past, and I know it can be so good and even better. Would you like to partner with us? I want you to understand this. When I say partner, I don't just mean partner like this is for free. <laughs> they said, this is something that is residual. This is something that it helps us and it helps you. Do you want to partner with us? Do you understand what God is doing here? God is taking care of this ministry and putting funds into our ministry so that we can do ministry. Like It's, it's like Moses' mother. <laughs> you remember the story of Moses' mom who floats that baby down the river? Pharaoh's daughter gets it and, and says, hey, go find one of those little Hebrews to nurse. And the little girl runs and gets Moses' mom to nurse his baby. 
She was getting paid to do what she would do no matter what. And here's what God said, I'm going to pay you to, to do what you've already been doing in partnership. But I just want you to know, I'm not doing it for the money. If anything, the money's just so we can go do more stuff for free out there in the community. But I just want you to know, this partnership is our rope. It's our rope. It's our way to say, how can we be empathetic, innovative, and expectant that somebody is going to have an encounter with Jesus? Hey, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the content. Be sure to like and comment. If you want more videos like this, hit the subscribe button right now. And then right next to it is a little bell. Touch the little bell, click the little bell, and that's gonna turn on notifications so when we upload another video, you'll know when it comes.